Okay, hello everyone again, and thank you for staying with us. We've been getting a lot of feedback, so we've moved to headphones. Hopefully this will fix the technical problem. Um, so we're going to have another go. Uh, my name is Becky. I work for the Southwest Coast Path Association, and we're the charity that looks after the Southwest Coast Path. Um, so I first got to know Raina. Uh, we actually remember when my colleague first said about your article that was published in the uh, in the big issue um, and ever since then we've stayed in touch and thank you so much for joining us today uh, we're going to be talking about your new book the wild silence which I have here and I have been reading the last uh, week or two and absolutely loving it it really is amazing and I have to say the only thing I would say is that it would have been even better if it come out in winter because there's something about your book that just makes you want to curl up in front of the fire with a cup of tea and just be transported somewhere else. Um, so we're going to go into some questions first, then we're going to hear a reading from Raina, and then we're going to go on to some questions from some of your fans who are tuning in and hopefully hearing us okay this time. So Raina, as anyone who has read The Salt Path knows, you had the most amazing, incredible, life-changing time on the Southwest Coast Park. But since then, you're now a published author. So how has life changed for you? Well, life, I think, couldn't be any more different than when we first found ourselves on the, on the southwest coast path. I mean, then we had nothing. We just lost our house. Moth had just had his diagnosis and, and our life had fallen apart. So we, we were just living wild on those headlands because we had very, very few options. But then um, after the salt path, after the salt path was published, then life changed completely because because then I became a published author. Then I had to not only um, just promote the book, but I had to I had to talk to people, and I think that was the hardest hardest thing. I'd I'd sat in a little bubble in in the village where we'd found accommodation at the end of our walk, um, and. It had been a very strange experience. We'd come from those headlands and I thought going back under a roof, back into accommodation, everything would be easy, it would be straightforward and I'd just get on with life. But the transition from life in the tent to, to life back under a roof was really, really difficult. And I found myself, I couldn't settle and I couldn't sleep, even put the tent up in the bedroom for weeks because, because it just felt more like home. Um, so really, in a way, I think I was sort of withdrawing from people, withdrawing from, from ordinary life, normality. And then, then during that time, I wrote The Salt Path. And uh, I thought, mistakenly, that I would hand that manuscript over, manuscript over to the publishers and they would simply just miraculously put it onto the shelves and that would be that. Um, but uh, then they said that I had to take part in PR and talk to people and go to events. And uh, that, was, that was a really, really very different experience entirely. But I think actually meeting the people that I have done at events and uh, uh, in the book signings afterwards has been one of the, the most life-changing things that has happened for me, actually, because um, it's meant I had to connect with other people. I had to reconnect with normal life and, and found that actually we're all the same when it comes down to it. We all share the same hopes and the same fears and the same frailties. And, um, and I think... That whole experience changed my perspective on so many things and, and not just about books, but about life in general. So, so entirely different, <laughs> entirely different. Exactly. One. And actually that takes us to, you know, that's where we pick back up in the wild silence, that moment where you're really sort of trying to connect with people and, and trying to get to grips with how you're feeling and what you're thinking. And it's at that moment, I remember you saying you go out to the coast path and you're trying to get that sort of clarity. Um, I mean, how would you describe your relationship with the Coast Path now? I think I think it's as strong as it was when we were living on the Coast Path. Um, I think I think it all comes down to what you regard as home. To be honest, um, when we lost our house at the beginning of the Salt Path, I really thought that that I would never feel that sense of home again, that sense of belonging, that sense of safety and security that home represents. But then during all those weeks and months that we were walking on that coast path, I started to feel 
such a strong connection to that incredible strip of wilderness that's just caught between the, the edge of the land and the start of the sea that eventually, by the time we came to the end of that walk, I think that felt like home. It felt like a place where I belonged. So when we moved into the village at the end of our walk, and I was finding it so hard, I think it was because, because I'd always spent my life in the natural environment. I'd grown up on a farm, and Moth and I had had a place in the countryside in quite a remote space. And I'd never lived in a village before, never, never had to interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis like that before. So I found that I was often awake, even in the night, and just find myself going back up onto the coast path and, and just being there in the gorse, in the heather, in the, in the just rocks of the, of the coast path. And that's where I felt like I belonged. That's where I felt like I was somehow in, in touch with the core of who I am. And I think even now I, I go back there, go back to the coast path every week, whenever... I've got the possibility to. And um, I don't know, as soon as my feet find that strip of strip of land, it's as if I take a deep breath because it's like walking back through my front door, back back into where I belong. And and so yeah, very strange and uh, strange and interwoven relationship with that path, that's for sure. <laughs> well, and I think a lot of the people who are listening right now can really relate to that because a lot of the people we speak to really have their own connection to the path and I know in the book you you, you describe it as our path and uh, you know yours and moths and I think everyone sort of owns a small part of it in some way mm -hmm. um so speaking of moth you know this this is your story that you told but obviously moth is a huge part of it how does he feel about the fact that you know your story is out there for the world strange it's a very strange thing isn't it because I I, I wrote the salt path for him. I, I wrote that book entirely for him so that he would be able to look at it as his memory was starting to fade and remember that walk because for me it had felt like such an important, powerful part of our, our life and I didn't want him to forget it. And so I put so many personal details in that book that had I known that thousands of people were going to read it, maybe I wouldn't have put in there, I don't know. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, it, it was as much a surprise for him as it was for me to find that actually suddenly that very personal story was out there and we were sharing it with so many people. But, but at the same time, I think, I think he's had so many messages back from people, so much support and, and care from complete strangers that actually I think, I think he's very happy that the story is out there because, you know, it, it's become sort of a two-way thing, actually, that book. Um, we gave our story, but we've had so much back from the readers as well. But it's, it's become a, it's definitely become a two-way, two-way street, the book. Yeah. And it's, it's exactly, you know, what we've heard from people as well. We've had lots of people contact the charity saying, you know, oh, my God, we've read this amazing book about the self coast coast path you have to you have to read it um and you know they've been sharing their stories as well i mean how does it feel to know uh that you've you've inspired so many other people to go out and and do that walk even people who you know might not have ever known about it or might not have had the confidence to do it how does it feel to know you've inspired them to do it I think I think it's absolutely lovely because every day somebody will get in touch with me and say I'm about to start that walk I'm going to go and just walk for one day or I'm starting the whole thing and and that's really quite remarkable but I think I think probably the the most touching moment I had with regards to that was quite early on really possibly even before the salt path was published when I published an, that article for the big issue and um and it was probably about a month after that had been published, that first article, before the salt path came out. And I was on the coast path and saw someone coming towards me who, um, who was obviously a backpacker. But as he got closer, I could see, not your average backpacker, he got really um, quite old equipment that was surprising to see on such a young man. And uh, he, he got closer to me and he got an old rucksack with the, out, the frame on the outside and... Uh, a uh, high-vis jacket and a, you know, a lot of piercings. 
and we passed at a gate and it was it was my turn to say you know where you're heading to where you're coming from you know and he said oh I'm I'm just walking for as long as I can walk I started a couple of weeks ago I said well obviously you know what brought you here you don't look like somebody who walks very often you know what brought you here and he said well I read an article in the big issue about uh, about a couple who had walked the southwest coast path when they were homeless and I thought I can do that because just two weeks ago he was he was just sleeping on the streets of the local city and uh, he'd read that article and borrowed everything he needed from local charities and came to the coast path to the most southerly point and started walking east and uh, I said well come back have a cup of tea have some food have something he said no because this path has changed my life I've only been walking for two weeks but already it's changed my life and I can't go back to my old my old life I've got to keep going forward so I've got to find somewhere to put a tent and make my food because that's my routine now I don't know where it's taking me but this look this path is taking me forwards and I, I watched him walk away and I thought you know I, I could have been watching myself because he he was walking in growing strength that that path was giving him and I think I think that's the remarkable thing isn't it it's it's what it's what walking and what that incredible stretch of land can can do for people it's a powerful thing exactly and actually you know in the wild silence I know you um you touch upon how walking and being at, sort of at one with nature and, and spending time in the outdoors can really help our health and well-being. I mean, can you can you explain a bit more about that for us? Yeah, it's a strange connection, which I think Moth and I have had since our very early days together. Like I say, I, I grew up on a farm, lived a very rural, almost domestic rural life. But when I met Moth, he'd grown up on the edge of a town, but had a real draw to the wild places, to the mountains, to the, to the, to the edge, you know. And uh, together in those first years then, we just, we just spent as much time as we could exploring in the wild places, in the mountains, and until we had the children, and then it all sort of ground to a halt. Um, but I think at the core of who we are, that that unity that we'd found together exploring the natural world has stayed with us. And something within that, I think, took us to the Southwest Coast Path when, when we lost everything. It, it was a draw to that need to be out in nature, out in the wild. And I think there's so much to take from that because we started that walk in such a state of anxiety and, and bitterness and fear about the future. But as we walked, just, just simply by taking the next step and the next step, we started to let that go. And, and what we were discovering was we were finding, refinding that core of us, ourselves, I think. And in doing so, that wild space started to feed back. And we, we let go of all that fear and anxiety and, and just started to live just for that moment. Just for, just for feeling the wind and just for hearing the gulls. And there's an incredible, I think, sort of peace that you can find with that. Not to sound too hippie about it, but I think, I think there's, a, there's a real sense of, of release, I think, because you, the wild space, nature, forces you to experience the moment. You listen to the birds. You can feel the rain on your face. And, and you're feeling that moment, aren't you? And you're letting go of everything else during that moment. But I think there's a lot more to it than that. I think there's an awful lot of science behind uh, a, lot of, a lot of it, an awful lot of science about, um, about plant emissions. But I could get lost down the rabbit hole about that one. So. <laughs> yeah, we, get, we know from the wild silence, anyone reading it, Raina likes to do a lot of research. So, <laughs> um, so something that not everyone might know, uh, but you're actually uh, an ambassador for our charity now. So um, how important do you think it is that, you know, we do protect and look after these, these wild spaces, these protected lands, um, to make sure that we can all enjoy them? 
Well, absolutely. I think one of the proudest moments for me when after the Salt Path was published was when you, Becky, got in touch with me and said, would you like to be an ambassador for the path? Well, I was absolutely touched by that because that path meant so much to me. It, it had been everything. It had changed my life. Just having access to that space and the time on that path, in that space, had changed our lives. And the amount of people that I've spoken to since that have had the same experience on different trails in different parts of the country, in our national parks, on our national trails, it changes lives. It allows us to, to take a step back from the, the harshness and the, the speed of life and to reconnect with the what we really are, which is actually organic beings who are part of that natural world and we need it we need that connection and it should be available to us it should be available to everyone absolutely and I, i'm just going to say I'm, I'm keeping an eye on a few comments that are coming in and everyone is saying thank you so much for for what your story has done for them as well so it's amazing it's, it's so nice to know that everyone else is joining us today um so Speaking of everyone else getting in touch, again at the charity, we hear from a lot of people who are feeling very creatively inspired after they've walked the path, after they've been out and they've had that experience. Um, have you got any tips or advice for people who want to try having a go at writing their own book, their own novel, their own memoir? Um, you know, any words of wisdom? Well, it's tricky, isn't it? Because I'm, you know... Uh... I've written two books, but I don't see myself as a writer. Um, <laughs> I had this sort of dream when I was a child that I would grow up to be a writer and, and have a book published, but then, you know, life got in the way and I didn't do it. But then I sat down to write my book and I wasn't writing a book. I was just trying to capture the memory of that walk. And I tell you what, I used this little book here. It's Paddy Dillon's guidebook that we used as we walked that coast path. And as you can see, it's a bit battered, it's a bit wrinkled. And uh, I think it's a, bit like the, it's a bit like the sand when the tide's gone out and it's just moved by the water. And um, I opened this book and in it were Paddy's incredible descriptions and the, his, his OS map that runs right through the book, the whole, the whole coast. But more than that, there were moths penciled notes in, the, in all the margins of the book. And I started writing it just to write up his penciled notes because they were fading away. And I, I wanted him to hold on to that memory. But then the story wasn't in those notes. The story was in the feeling behind them. It was, it, it was in the feeling of the wind on your face or the rain on your skin or the sun as it was burning your back or how that, how that rucksack bit into your shoulders. And, and, and when you spoke to somebody, the look in their eyes, not what came out of their mouths, but their body language. And I think, I think maybe when you try to write something, it's really easy to say what happened this is what happened. But I think the hard thing is to say, this is how it felt when that happened. And I think that's the difference. I think if you're going to write something down, don't just, don't just write the black and white bits. You've got to write all the little colours in between. And, and then, then you'll look back and it will be your memoir because you're, it will be what you felt at the time. That's a great advice. And, and for anyone, who is uh, working towards becoming a completer. So we accept lots of completer stories and I think that is some really good advice. Um, yeah, to think about how you felt at the time as well. Um, so quite a few people are asking and it was one of my questions as well. Uh, there is some rumors uh, about there potentially being a TV series or a film of The Salt Path. Uh, can you shed any light on that? Is that at least true? Yes, um, the book has been optioned for a film. Um, now, I, I knew nothing about the whole film process before this, but apparently um, a, a book gets optioned and that gives the, the producer the 
option to make a film. So now he's gone away and he's in the process of putting together a film. And um, it's hopefully going to be filmed starting about this time next year. And and so long as you're happy with it, Becky, on the coast of that. <laughs> I'll get you the filming permissions, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan, that it will be filmed on the coast path, sort of starting filming about this time next year. Um, yeah. um, fingers crossed it goes ahead. <laughs> How exciting. Um, so actually I wanted to, you know, we were just talking about next year, but let's just focus back on this year. I mean, it's been a really, really strange one for all of us. Um, absolutely unprecedented times. Uh, how have you been coping through all this? And, and have, how has, I guess, walking and, and being at one with nature sort of helped you cope? I think um, I think we've been very lucky, Moth and I, because we've found ourselves during lockdown in a very quiet rural space um, where we had a place where we could walk just out of the door and, and walk outside and 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 be out in nature, and that's been really really important because um, we have been quite isolated during that time. We hardly saw anyone um, during those months, and. Um, but what we did have was time here, just watching the seasons pass, watching the, the insect life starting to come back in the spring and, and migrant birds coming and nesting and then they're, they're, they're young fledging and leaving and all the wildlife that has come and gone with all that insect life that's been here. And um, I think we've been incredibly lucky for that, be, for having that time to watch that and to to experience that but I think in a way we've all had that in a way because even in an urban space we've been able to open a window and hear the birds sing in a way that we may never have heard them before because of all the background noise and I think in a way that's sort of that's how I see our connection to the natural world we're part of it there's no escaping that we are part of the natural world and that connection is always there whether we acknowledge it or whether we don't and it's the same as those birds they're always singing we just can't always hear them and i think i think in a way it's given us all time to start to reflect on where we where we fit into the pattern of of life really i actually thought it was when i first heard the title of your book it you know it was that period you, during lockdown where you were hearing birds because there wasn't that hum of traffic going past. And I was wondering, yeah, as you read the book, you learn more about why the title is the title. But for me, that's that's where my mind instantly went. Yeah. Um, so is there, a, is there a third book on the way? We've talked about a film, but is there a third book Brimbling away somewhere. Yes, yes. I, I'm, I'm sort of started a little bit of background work on the third one, but there will be a third definitely great <laughs> very exciting um so if it's okay with you Raina, we're going to do uh, a little short reading uh, from the book if you're happy to do so and then yeah. afterwards we're going to open it out to some of the questions that have been coming in from people um so anyone who is listening please do um comment tell us where you um, where you're listening in from and feel free to get some questions in whilst Raina's reading i will do my best to sort of collate some of the, the ones that have come in and we'll, we'll ask as many as we can. Otherwise, over to you. Okay, well, what I'm going to read from is a part of the wild silence where we go on, to, on a trek in Iceland. Uh, Martha, myself, and we go with, if you remember from the Salt Pass, Dave and Julie, a couple that we met on the, the South Coast. And uh, we go to Iceland to trek a, a trail that's... Uh, now... I'm going to give you a little warning here. It's, this is full of Icelandic words. And I can't pronounce them at all. Um, as we were walking, we sort of made up our own English versions of what these incredibly strange words sounded like. And now, even though I know the right pronunciations, I can't get those made up words out of my head. So anyone who speaks Icelandic, I'm sorry. And you just have to go with the flow. <laughs> It seems not all noodles are the same. Some just aren't yellow mush, but are practically edible. I emptied some nuts into a bowl of teriyaki noodles and they almost smelled appetising. Moth sank, sat guiltily at the end of the table, waiting to use the pan, his tin of baked beans waiting to be opened. I glanced up the table 
unsure whether to laugh or be annoyed. He was finding it impossible to convert the value of the Icelandic krona into pounds sterling and had unwittingly paid five pounds for the tin in the tiny shop on the school bus. Next to us, two young Germans had the contents of their rucksacks hung from the roof of the food tent and draped across their table. Just drying out? We went to Raftenuska, but the weather was so bad, we turned round and came straight back. You walked all the way there and back in a day. Why didn't you just stay there? The next huts were at Raftenuska, eight miles away across the mountains and mainly uphill. I couldn't imagine why they would go all that way and then just come back again. The path from there looks really hard and this weather is so bad. We're going back to Reykjavik to hire a jeep for a week. No more hiking for us. Crikey, that's a long way in a day. Well, have a good time in the jeep. Thank you, we will. We're very happy not to be hiking. Moth rolled the bean tin between his hands. If it was too tough for young, fit, well-equipped hikers, what chance did we have? You shouldn't go up. It's not safe for people like you up there. The bean tin was gently placed on the table. Like us? He pushed it slightly away. Yes, old people. It's not safe for you. Moth passed the pan so he could empty his beans. Obviously, we'd be sharing the trail, starting a trail tomorrow, whatever the weather. The few remaining campers gathered in the river as the evening became colder, a multilingual shoal in the steaming warmth. The rain had stopped and two curious sheep gazed close to the water, sitting down to chew and watch the odd behaviour of the humans. Hours passed, our skin shriveled and slowly all the others left. I sat back to back with Moth, propped together at the extreme of our heat tolerance. Dave and Julie headed to the tent and we were alone in the water, just us and the sheep, watching the clouds change colour as if backlit by volcanoes. Drifting in and out of sleep, warmer in the river than in the tent. Even with down-filled three-season sleeping bags, the nights were already proving to be too cold to sleep through. I had no idea how we'd stay warm in the mountains, or if we would make it up there at all. No need to discuss it. We'd find a way, or not. Just a few years earlier, the possibility of us sitting in a hot river in Iceland had seemed as unlikely as us walking the southwest coast path, or living in an orchard. But we learnt so many things on that long, long walk. Things that we carried with us like precious jewels into the life that came after. So there seemed little point in worrying about whether or not we were capable of climbing the Ayafalayoko volcano or passing through the Fimmervordal mountain range. We knew that time would answer most of our questions, so didn't bother asking them, but sat in the river instead, shriveled but warm, breathing sulphur fumes until we fell into a deep sleep and woke underwater. So I, th I think I read that bit because um, we'd found ourselves on this trail in the southern upland highlands of Iceland in uh, what was the end of their summer and the very start of winter. And, um, and we were back again in the tent, wild camping in utterly remote and ridiculous spots and eating noodles. And I think I thought coast path or southern highlands of Iceland, you know, some things in life never change. I'm cold <laughs> noodles. <laughs> well, it's so lovely to hear that. And um, yeah, I think you did really well. I don't know how those words are supposed to be pronounced, but they sounded quite convincing yeah. to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've had lots of questions coming in. Um, unsurprisingly, one of, the, one of the top ones that's being asked is everyone wants to know how Moth is doing, because obviously, we all feel hugely connected to him and yourself by reading the book. So how, how is he? Moth, he, he's not as well as he was when we finished walking the coast path, um, because mainly because he took his degree at the end of that, that walk. And it's quite a sedentary process, actually, taking the degree. <laughs> you know, lots of sitting down. And um, he, did, he did graduate uh, a couple of years ago, um, but it had taken a toll on his health 
But now, luckily, we've found ourselves in a place where he can be active out in the, in the natural world as much as possible, and that's put him on a sort of plateau. But every time we take another long walk, like Iceland, like redoing our favourite stretches of the coast path, he feels an uplift in his health that, that has been told, we've been told by the consultants won't happen. So, so we've got another big walk planned for next year in the hope that... Exciting. That one. <laughs> yes, and maybe the third book. Hmm. Um, and so actually, you know, you're now living on the orchard and, you know, people who read the book will learn a bit more about where you are. Someone wants to know, have you made some cider yet? We have, we have, yes, but we're, we're just about to start the process again because it's that time of year. The apples are ready to pick and um, we'll be uh, back down into the cider bowl. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, a question you probably ha had, I'm sure, at some of the, the sort of the book signings you've been to for the, for the Salt Path. What part of the Southwest Coast Path is your favourite? Oh, and that's such a difficult question because there are so many incredible parts of that path. It's so diverse, isn't it? There's so much to it. I could say those amazing cliffs of Exmoor where, where the path is so close to the cliff edge that you feel like you're flying with the gulls or all that really, really calm, tranquil lagoon behind Chesil Beach where it's like time has stopped and, and you're just in, in this amazing space. But I think... Uh, for me, it will always have to be those blocky granite cliffs at the very end of the land, uh, just beyond Land's End, beyond the buildings and that awful thing that is the Land's End building, but onto those blocky granite cliffs beyond there, where when we reached there on our walk, we'd just got a Mars bar and £2.50 in our pockets, and it was just the two of us standing there at the very edge of the land, and the start of the sea and putting that tent up and there was just nothing except those wet sheets of nylon between us and those weather systems that were just coming barreling in. But there was something so uplifting in that moment, which should have been one of the worst moments, but we realised that that time spent on that path had given us back a, a, a hope for life that we thought we'd never feel again. And I think, I think for that, I will always go back to those cliffs there at the very edge of the land and feel the force of the weather in my face and, and I'm alive and there's hope. And yeah, for that, it would always have to be that point. That's lovely. Yeah, it's, it's always a question. Yeah, I get the same question. I find it very, very hard to pick one spot. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a few more coming in. Uh, a very good question. Who would you want to play you in the film or will you be playing yourselves? No, it won't be us. No, <laughs> they want actors. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone in mind you'd like to play you? <laughs> um, well, I, I did think Olivia Coleman because I thought she'd get the humour in the salt path. Uh, but then she went and won an Oscar, didn't she? So I don't know if she'd be interested now. <laughs> oh, she'd be fantastic, wouldn't she? Um, so someone's asked about uh, how your your children have reacted to the bit uh, the books. Um, so yeah, how how have they been? Well, it was really hard for them because obviously they lost their home too, and they were both in their last year of uni when when we started walking that path. Um, so it was a really hard time for them too because there was no going home and finding themselves or going off travelling. They had to find accommodation and, and work and, and just find a way back into life themselves. But strangely enough, they've turned into quite balanced adults, really. <laughs> and, and I think they're both just incredibly proud of the books and of, of the fact that we've just found a way to get on with life and, and go forwards and not look back. So I think I think that weird time brought us all closer as a family, really, even though we were apart at the time. Mm. And uh, so a question that actually came in on email before we started is someone was talking about um, in the wild silence. You do talk a lot about obviously the weather, but also beyond that climate uh, and climate change and campaigns um, like Extinction Revolution. What is what are your feelings on this? What is it that you think we should be? I guess, doing with this enormous challenge that we're all facing? I think first we've got to face it, haven't we? 
We've got to face it and we've got to acknowledge that it's happening. And until, you know, collectively, as a, as a species, we do that, I can't see anything being effective. But I think, I think we've actually got to do that. We've got to face it because then we can all, every single one of us, we can make a difference. We can decide whether or not we're going to use um, a diesel vehicle. We can decide whether or not we need a plastic wrapper. We can decide whether or not we're going to cut that hedge right now when it's full of blackberries, or we're going to leave it until until January when it, all the leaves have gone and there's no food for the wildlife. We, we can make those decisions, but collectively first, we've got to acknowledge that it's it's a priority and it's a problem. And we've got to, we've got to realize that because until we can, we can get so many more people that actually have the power to do something on board with that thought, then I don't know whether we can actually make any progress. I mean, the wild silence, I talk a lot about the climate and you're the first person in all the interviews that I've done that has actually picked that up. I think many people don't realize that what I'm talking about in in the wild silence is about the climate, is about how, how we have let go of our biodiversity, but how simply by taking a step back from the natural world, by taking the heavy human input out of the natural world, how it can actually start to rebuild itself, it can regenerate. There is hope for that. Uh, and also, you know, how, how in the wild science have paralleled moth's health, really, with what's happening in the climate. How by the time that we spent living wild, really, on that coast path, it allowed him to, to find a far more natural state of existing and how his health improved. In the same way, without giving too much away, where we found ourselves now, living now, simply by withdrawing so much of the human input from the land, it has started to regenerate. And, and I think there's, a, there's such a lesson to be learned about, it's not, sometimes it's not about what we do do, it's about what we don't do and about taking a much lighter step. And I think if, if this lockdown has taught us anything, it's been that we are part of the natural world because this, this pandemic is, it's a natural illness. It's a natural virus. It's something that has occurred and it's affecting our organic state of being. And, and I think if we can acknowledge that actually what happens to the climate and what happens to nature happens to us, it's not something outside of us. It is part, we are part of it. And whatever declines in the natural world, it will take us with it. Um, that's, that's the start of, the start of hope and the start of positivity. Um, and we've all shown that we can, we can work perfectly well from home, that we don't need to make those commutes. And, um, and that we can teach our children how to grow tomatoes on the windowsill. <laughs> and, and that's the start, isn't it? It's yeah. We've, we've well, got to do it before we can do anything about it. <laughs> yeah, and I think as well, being out on these trails, it's, it's where you get closest to seeing all of these things uh, up close and personal. But as you say, it's around us all the time and it's just noticing it. So um, I think we're going to have to, well, start to wrap up. I could literally talk to you for hours. Um, but I'm just going to double check that you haven't got any more questions coming in. Um, yeah, so I think we've covered probably as many as we can now. Just I'll take one more. So um, have you got any uh, more plans to do any other international trails? Uh, maybe like the Camino de Santiago or something like Ooh, that? Do that. There's so many I'd, I'd really like to do, so many trails I'd love to do. But I've seen this really nice one in Holland, in the Netherlands, that, that runs right down through the Netherlands. And it looks so flat. Might give that a go. <laughs> So, yeah, a bit different to the coast path, definitely. And actually, uh, surprising, while we've got everyone's attention, what was quite exciting is today there was a new fastest known time set on the coast path. So someone today just finished and did it in 10 days. 10 days. <laughs> Which is wow. Sheer madness, I know. But we all do it in different ways. It's there for everyone to go out and enjoy and do it in whatever way you want. 
Um, so yeah, I'm going to thank you so much, Reina, for joining us today. As I said, I could sit here and ask you questions all day long, but we will have to finish at some point. So I'm just going to remind everyone, The Wild Silence, it is out now. Uh, you can actually go and buy a copy from um, our website. So if you go to um, southwestcoastpath.org.uk forward slash shop, you can order a copy and uh, we'll be sending it out to you um, at the end of September. And the first 10 copies will get a signed copy from Raina. So very exciting. So if you head over super soon, you might be one of the lucky ones to get the first 10. Um, we also, uh, obviously, it's being sold in all major bookstores. So you can go to Hive to find all the independent bookstores, but also Waterstones and Amazon, um, or go and support your local bookstore, wherever that is. And uh, yeah, finally, if you've enjoyed today's session with Raina, um, so we are a charity and all of the money goes back to looking after that beautiful path that we all enjoy, um, that has inspired so many people and supported so many people in their lives. Uh, so if you have enjoyed today's session, please do consider making a donation to the charity. You just need to go to southwestcoastpath.org.uk forward slash donate. And that would be wonderful. So thank you so much. Um, Hopefully we'll have a recording of this available um, in the next week or two. So if you've missed it or um, you want to share with a friend or something like that, everyone, please check back to our social media and we will share it uh, with you at a later date. So thank you. And do say hello to Moff to us. I know he's, uh, I know he's there well behind you somewhere, <laughs> giving you cups of tea. <laughs> well Here he is. He's going to come in. Thank you so much. It's, it's been really special. Lovely to hear you read from the book. So great to see you guys there. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm already so surprised to see how well the house is looking from behind you. I was like, are you actually in the farmhouse? That can't be the same one that's being described in the book. So you've obviously done a huge amount of work. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much. We're really looking forward to the third book, the film. We want it all. There's lots of fans here who just mm -hmm. adore you. So thank you, Becky. That's lovely. And thank you, everyone. Lovely. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. <laughs>